We are live while I open my audio software. Hello, oh, world. I should, too. <laughs> Good idea. This, this is a weird week, y'all. So, so the reason we're back to recording on a Friday is I done screwed up. Um, we we are working with uh, Libsyn to come up with advertisers to help us out. Apologies that you have to now listen to advertisements periodically. Um, but the side effect of that is that there is a calendar of the dates that we're supposed to launch the ads. And I misread it as the calendar we were recording the, the shows. And recording mm. and posting are not the same thing. So we need a show to post Monday because I screwed up. Right. I admit So here it. we are. <clears throat> no holiday. Nope, we none just for work. us. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. Man, uh, this is such a terrible week. I know. It's... I, I keep thinking back that when I was in, in high school, I worked at the Six Meter in the Caucasus Mountains and, and like drove through so many of the areas where, the, where we see images now of Russia building up troops and yeah. the astronomers I worked with were Ukrainian astronomers working at a telescope that is now in Russia and I had a student who had a Ukrainian mother and a Russian father and a student who had a Moldovian parent and a Russian <sighs> parent and yeah. It's, yeah it's everyone's just getting torn apart and yeah it's a nightmare my um so our our webmaster is ukrainian yeah and he's living in spain fortunately so he's not in the middle of it but his whole family and friends are all back in ukraine and so this yeah. is all he's thinking about um one of our site designers is in the same situation and and also my partner who helped build a bunch of the apps on universe today we built the phases oh of the i know app him together. yeah alex sweet, yeah sweet human yeah yeah and he and he's ukrainian as well he's living in canada yeah. which is sort of strange because i you know i was able to sort of help him get a residency in canada a couple of years ago yeah but but still i mean just like there's this connection back to ukraine and and uh yeah Anyway, let's uh, let's do our let's do our show, man. Bummer what's show. Our, yeah, what's our episode number? Um, six thirty-two. Okay, and we're both apparently going to take turns sniffling all episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So let me know when you are ready. Okay. I'm ready. We are recording. Astronomy Cast, episode 632, Building Images in Optical and Radio. I forgot to record the video. Hold on. I'm going to make you say that again. I, okay. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right, I'll restart my audio. Okay. You ready? Yep. Okay. Try again. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm recording. Astronomy Cast, episode 632, Building Images in Optical and Radio. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of Cosmos. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? It's, it's a week where I've decided that is a question that we probably shouldn't mm. ask, and it's way better to simply say, yeah. are you okay? To which I can answer yeah. yes. Yes, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, it's, this is a tough week. Uh, you know, some, I was mentioning before the show, um, our webmaster on Universe Today is, is from Ukraine. He's not living in Ukraine right now, but that's, you know, that's where he comes from. Um, and a bunch of other people on our team similar yeah. situation so uh you know it's it's tough it's it's hard and it's scary and it's uh I, i'm really hoping for just as much safety and minimal casualties and a peaceful resolution to this whole situation it really sucks i hate it yeah what what he said <sighs> <laughs> a recent image from the South African Meerkat telescope 
blew our minds. It was a high resolution image of the center of the Milky Way showing delicate filaments and other structures. What was so mind blowing is that this was an image from a radio telescope. Today, we're gonna to talk about why this was such an accomplishment and what the future holds for radio astronomy. And we'll do it, but it's time for a break. And we're back. All right, so did you see this picture? I, I did, and I'm actually gonna bring it up so that everyone here can see it in glorious, not quite as blocked out by Fraser detail. Yeah. Um, this, this is the heart of our galaxy in a way we've never seen it before. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to describe it because I mean, a lot of people are, are have this on podcast, you know, are getting this as a podcast. And so I will try to explain it a little bit because I think it's really important. And, and if you want to see the picture for yourself, and you're just, just do a search for like your cat, like the animal Milky Way, and you'll get and we this have image show that's, notes. And yeah, we have some links in the show notes, but you'll see this image that sort of is, is looks like a negative with with mostly white with this red core but there's some other images out there as well and and it's sort of weird and cool with a lot of really intricate details why is this such an important image it's the first time we've been able to see the core of our galaxy at this particular combination of resolution and wavelength. And every time we're able to get a better image of something, it reveals new details. It's, it's literally gonna say, when just we go the back, new details. Yeah, so we'll, you know, if we, if I think back to some really old episodes that we did, we, we went through the electromagnetic spectrum, we did an episode on radio telescopes, and we talked about how radio telescopes the way they work isn't conducive to making pictures so can you explain sort of how a radio telescope produces an image well all telescopes luckily produce images pretty much the same way but the difference comes in radio wavelengths are really really big so when we talk about optical images we're talking about light that is a few hundred nanometers in size, 400 nanometers, 800 nanometers, somewhere in there. And that is like significantly smaller than the size of a hair. And with a radio telescope, we're talking about wavelengths that are measured somewhere in millimeters to meters and kilometers. It just right. keeps going. Yeah. And so, sorry. And so like when you have these these nanometer 100 nanometer hundreds of nanometers uh falling on say a telescope or on your eyeball you're getting a lots of them all at the same time yeah so you're seeing whether it's a nebula or an apple or a tree or whatever you're seeing all of these photons all at the same time and what's more than that, the resolution that, that we're able to see isn't so much related to just how many photons you get, period, but how many of the wavelengths can fit across your detector. So if you have a single mirrored optical telescope that's a meter across and you're looking at light that is measured in nanometers which is 10 to the negative nine mm -hmm. you're gonna get a lot of wavelengths across your one meter telescope a lot of them right yeah but if you're instead looking at yeah and if you're instead looking at one centimeter wavelengths you're gonna get a hundred of them right. and right. and that many factors of 10 that go into that from centi to nano um that is the difference in your resolution and that... i guess like I, you know i sort of think back to that episode that we did and, and imagining like i remember the conversation quite vividly because i've used it in i've used versions of it in explaining this as well with a radio telescope 
you're taking a fairly large sensor and you're just scanning it across the sky and you're saying yes radio no radio <laughs> and and the strength of the signal you know seven three yeah you know and you're moving and 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 the big modern innovation was to go from just one sensor to maybe four and i think yeah. you were saying like on the arecibo they still have like a handful like what like 16 or something like that when arecibo was rolling like your resolution was terrible again it was just some version of is the radio over there yes there's radio over there um not producing this beautiful subtle image uh, you just yeah. get you just get and, and if you look in like um journal articles you'll see just these blobs these these quite mediocre looking blobs that i'm sure are filled with all kinds of really fascinating right. scientific information but but we have a hard time running those on universe today you know this this blob is a supermassive black hole gobbling material from the from the nearby surroundings and blasting out stellar yeah. waves look at it in all its blobby glory right and and this is where luckily a lot of times the things that we look at in radio are quite big mm -hmm. um so so there there has been some use for all these blobby images specifically in looking at active galactic nuclei active galaxies are little bitty tiny things in optical where we're only seeing their star filled areas but that black hole feeding in the center is devouring massive amounts of material, developing massive magnetic fields, developing even more massive jets, spewing material out of the center of the active galactic nuclei. So for decades, the fact that we were dealing with really blobby images that were super low resolution using our sometimes when we were lucky kilometer across telescope to look at centimeter wavelength light um we were fine with that and we were happy enough and we did lots of science but then what was realized pretty early on with with optical telescopes if you want to combine the light from optical telescopes, you have to do crazy stuff with fiber optics. So the, the light effectively has the same travel distance from object to detector, no matter where you put the telescopes, and you're mechanically combining the light from the different telescopes so that you're dealing with the same wave front hitting your detector from all of the scopes. This this is I mean, it's very kind hard. of like focusing an image. It's kind of like focusing like when you think about an image it's kind of blurry and then you turn the focus wheel and then mm -hmm. it comes in and gets sharper and sharper. And I guess when you're when you're using interferometry, there's there's some version of that where all the wave fronts align and you're like, ha, we're there. We're you know, within five hundred nanometers. Whatever you do, don't jiggle any one of the telescopes because there's yeah. no you've got to be perfect within yeah. this incredible tolerance. And so what was the what was the sort of the big discovery with radio telescopes then? Well, with radio telescopes, you just record it all on tape and deal with it later. Because with radio data, the wavelengths are so big, we can look at the data and pretty much go, I see the wavelength. And combine them by having fairly precise clocks on each of the telescopes. So instead of trying to mechanically combine light with fiber optics, it's just a matter of taking all of the recordings and shoving them into a really fancy high power computer and out comes your integrated data on the other side. And the really amazing thing, and this is the place where the maths in astrophysics get insane with combining electronics, everything you ever wanted to know about electronics, and physics all together at the same time. They, they have realized that any one individual telescope has a field of view, a beam size on the sky that is related to how big that dish is, how many wavelengths fit across the dish, give or take things like shadowing from the detectors and stuff like that, that the fancy word is attenuates the beam. It makes it less efficient. Now, mm. 
that gives you a field of view on the sky that is the same thing as your resolution pretty much if you're only using that one dish. Now, if instead you're combining a whole bunch of different dishes, there is complex maths called a fast Fourier transform, which is beyond the scope of attempting to explain yeah. in anything less than 16 weeks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Should we do that? Can we do a 16 no, week no. long episode of Astronomy Cast from, I, I did, from the beginning to doing your own fast Fourier transforms by no, hand? No, 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 no. Um, so, so, so there, there's this way of combining the, the, this detector looked at that beam width on the sky, which equates to this specific field of view. And when you combine the data across all of the different dishes, suddenly you still have that same field of view, but you're able to resolve out features within that field of view that are the resolution of if you had used a single dish, the size of all of those spacings added together. So if east to west, you spread out your telescopes 100 kilometers, you now have a resolution east-west on the sky that is related to that 100 kilometers divided by your wavelength instead of the however many meters your dish is divided by the wavelength. It's a huge improvement and is what allows us to, to do what is done with, with telescopes like Meerkat, where they're starting to spread things out over continents. Yeah. All right, yeah. well, we're going to talk about this some more in a second, but it's time for a break. And we're back. All right, so you were starting to shift into this conversation about Meerkat. And so when we think about a traditional radio telescope, we're thinking about, say, the very large array, a gigantic right. dish, or maybe the Green Bank Observatory, or Jodrell Bank, this giant dish that is yeah. pointed to the sky, usually with some radio astronomer nearby with headphones on listening for the sounds of aliens. Yes. Uh, maybe that was maybe that was contact. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but when you look at the Murchison array and Meerkat, they do not look like a giant dish. What's going on? Well, so, so Meerkat is is a variety of what are called off axis um, dishes where the, the way they put them together, we're going to pause. I apologize. All of you editing people. I want a picture on the screen. I am now torturing our editing staff. I am sorry, editing staff. Sometimes you just need an image and I forgot to get this image first. And I'll get Murchison too while I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Meerkat's like marginally similar. <clears throat> yeah. Me Me Murchison, it Murchison is su super Murchison weird. is the weird one. Yeah. Murchison is, is spiders in the desert. Yeah. Uh, give me an image, you silly sites. There we go. Spiders in the desert. They really do look like something that would come alive and eat you in your sleep. Don't you mean protect you from from nasty insects? Haven't Make you ever spiders. had to reduce data? It attacks. It doesn't protect. <laughs> okay. Um, there we go. Uh, all right, I'm going to go back to answering your question. Or do you want to re-ask it so they have a cleaner cut? Sure, yeah. Um, Just come back right, from commercial? So we were, yeah, okay. All right, okay, we'll do that. And we're back. And so we were leading up to this conversation about Meerkat. So how does is Meerkat different from this very traditional big radio dish that we're so familiar with? So, so it is not all that different. It uh, has a, a off-axis detector, and this allows it to get a better view with less 
I'm going to say the word noise, which is not scientifically correct, and then explain what I mean. So normally when you're using a radio dish, you're, you're pointed at your object, you get this beautiful peak in your data related to that core beam of sensitivity coming in. But then various things also are like, hey, we're going to make a mess of your data for you. And it creates side lobes. And those side lobes, these, they're literally blobby bits that come off the sides of your data. Um, those side lobes get bigger and bigger the more stuff you stick in the center of your telescope. So when you have a big old right where everything comes together at the top of the dish, detector, it gives you bigger side lobes. When you instead move your detector off axis, like they've done with Murchison, it knocks down those side lobes and it allows you to have a cleaner footprint on the sky and less noise and start to get better images. So they improved how they're able to see by reducing their side lobes by using this other geometry. And in addition to that, they just built a whole lot of telescopes spread out a whole, over a whole lot of space. And this, all of this together, with added sensitivity, they have cleaner electronics that are able to be more sensitive to what's in the sky. All of that added together gets the beautiful images we see. Yeah, and they've got like, what, 64 separate telescopes acting as one it's, and they it's kind and they, of awesome yeah and they both have the separation which as you said gives you that interferometry so really they're acting like a telescope that is as big as the the leftmost telescope across to the rightmost telescope the gap in between that is the size of the telescope that they act like um but also the combined resolution of all of the if you add up all of their surface areas, you also get that as well. And so it makes for a very gigantic, very sensitive telescope. Now, Murchison, which is also going to be, you know, it's sort of like the sister project to Meerkat, yeah. looks like spiders in the desert. Yeah. What's going on there? So as, as you look at longer and longer wavelengths of light, your telescopes stop looking like telescopes in a lot of ways. Um, when you look at an optical mirror, there, there are no flaws you can see with your human eyeballs unless like something really bad happened. I mean, really bad happened. Now, with a standard telescope like the VLA, like Murchison for radio, you start to see things that are the size of basically chicken wire because your wavelengths are, are big enough that that kind of a deviation doesn't matter. Now, once you start getting to the long wavelengths, the really long wavelengths looked at by Murchison, they don't even bother with the dish anymore. They just stick an antenna out there and go, hi, we are looking yeah. up. I mean, like, think about your, like, uh, like television aerial. Like, yeah. I don't know about you, but when I grew up, yeah. we had this giant television aerial poking up the top of our house that mm -hmm. would turn. And mm -hmm. it was a radio telescope. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And so now they've just got these. And so same thing. They've just put, I don't know how many there are, but there are lots out there in the in the desert separated and same thing each one is collecting radio waves but they're also working together like one giant telescope the size of their separation and and they come in basically small herds of spiders <laughs> right. it's it's these little groups of something that looks like a portal nightmare video game horror story um I, I read way too much science fiction, y'all. Yeah. And don't um, take enough macrophotography images of bugs. No, I don't. I don't. That's your problem. Yeah. 
staring um, into their beautiful well, little no, eyes. Well, no, actual bugs I'm okay with. It's the robotic ones that worry <laughs> right, me. Right, of course. Yeah, the robot spiders. Yeah, yeah. Mechorachnophobia. I got so, it. It's I, Stargate. I blame Stargate. Oh, is that what it is? Stargate? <laughs> it's, the, uh, it's the nanites? Yeah, exactly. Um, All right, we're gonna, we got, we've got a little bit more to talk about, but I think we got to do another break. <laughs> and we're back. All right, bring it all together for me, Pamela. Yes. We've talked about how these images are made. We've talked about this incredible image that came out of Meerkat. How will this come together for the square kilometer array, the merging and expansion of these two telescopes into one continent spanning mega telescope? Well, it, so, so it unfortunately is not going to be a telescope that is the size of whatever the distance between South Africa and Australia is. The two parts of the square kilometer array that they're building on the two different continents are technologically very different because they're working at a different set of wavelengths, which is why Murchison in Australia and Meerkat in South Africa look radically different. So we're going to end up with sprawling across South Africa, a series of, you can recognize them as collecting radio signals, uh, telescopes that together will each look at their own tiny patch of sky, but where tiny is defined in uncomfortably large patches of the sky for us optical people. And when working together, each telescope's beam size becomes the field of view for the entire telescope when the data is brought together and they can see the high resolution. And then that whole scanning thing you mentioned, that still happens. Mm -hmm, they still mm -hmm. have to either scan the, the telescopes across the sky to get a bigger field of view or do a series of snapshots to get a larger field of view. Um, but we know how to do that. And it's not like we don't mosaic Hubble images as well. It's right. just a different size. Um, so we're going to end up with one continent working at one set of wavelengths, another continent working at another set of wavelengths, each set bringing us into, I'm going to say, a, a redder and redder part of the spectrum and allowing us to create images where when we put side by side the optical and the radio, it's no longer this highly detailed optical image and a blob of radio light. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's instead going to be that highly detailed optical image. And in some cases, an even more detailed radio image that are just looking at completely different physics of what's going on in the object. And once you start being able to combine the physics that creates the radio light, the physics that creates the optical light at the same resolution, it gets you a whole new way of trying to understand what's going on. And it's an amazing era I can't wait for. Yeah, I mean, I'm just like if you were looking at one of these radio images, mm -hmm. What is what are you seeing? Like what is what is the what are the radio waves trying to tell us? So, so radio waves are, are coming from electrons in magnetic fields. They are coming from very low energy transitions in molecules. Uh, that, that famous 21 centimeter line, which neither of these telescopes are really going to be looking at, um, it, it's created just by a spin flip in, in the hydrogen atom that is very rare, only occurs in diffuse cold areas. And it's these kinds of low energy physics that we're able to see with the radio world. And with optic, we're looking at hotter things, but not the hottest things. The hottest things come to us from x-ray. So what we're really probing is different energy events, different, well, since electrons and magnetic fields are happily creating all sorts of really cool radio astronomy stuff to look at. We're looking at physics of magnetic fields. And 
you can also do all sorts of cool measurements of the dust off of systems and how things are, how the light gets scattered as it comes through by looking at the polarimetry of it. I could just, I'm, I'm going to stop now. There's a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cool. Ma magnetic, magnetic fields. Yes. Mm. And are, cool stuff and cool stuff. And, co and very, very cool stuff. Yeah. Like temperature wise, but also, yes. you know, yeah, aesthetically. Yes. All right. Very cool. Well, again, like I think if if you are listening to this podcast, when you get a chance, check the show notes, the image. And I hope this time when you see it, you'd be like, OK, this is important. And I and this is the first time we're seeing an image, a radio image with this level of clarity. And it is a harbinger of the future of a really exciting future where radio finally gets to stand up and be appreciated for the beauty the visual astronomers have been have been receiving for decades. Finally. Finally, radio astronomers, you have arrived. All right, thanks, Pamela. Thank you, Fraser, and thank you to all of you out there who support our show through Patreon. This week, we would like to thank Kellyanne and David Parker, G4184, Gabriel Galfin, Rachel Fry, Andrew Stevenson, Dustin Ralph, Planetar, Brent Cranop, Peter, Sean Matz, Kinsaya Pinflienko, Smotsky, Sean Freeman, Blexa the Cat, The Mysterious Mark, Joe Wilkinson, Benjamin Davies, Stephen Coffey, Glenn McDavid, John Drake, John Oshef, Roland Warmerdam, Dean the Air Major, Lou Zealand, Bart Flaherty, Tim Garish, Claudia Mastriani, Brian Kelby, Corinne Demtruck, Nalia, or Naya, she gave me pronunciation guides. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jordan Turner, Lee Harborn, Mark Phillips, Catherine Matson, Bob the Boodle Cat, uh, Chris Wheelwright, Jason Cardukas, Olivia Brian Zank, Ron Tarson, Papa 1062, Robert Hundy, Kim Barron, Vitali, Paul Esposita, uh, Arthur Latzhall, Frank Stewart, Ganesh, Swamathan, Bob Zatsky, Connor, Ruben McCarthy, Jeff McDonald, Iggy Hammock, Wayne Johnson, and Rebecca. Thank you all so very much. Awesome. Thank you so much. And then they saved. And then they saved. Yeah, actual bugs. I'm totally down with actual bugs. Yeah. Robot bugs. Not okay with those. Uh, okay, if you say so. <laughs> okay, did anyone have any questions? I didn't see any questions come up. Um, let me look over on uh, Twitch. I have inadvertently given Veronica cure nightmares. Sorry. <laughs> Uncle Bill Dor Druin writes, we science the heck out of those blobs. It's true. It's, it's true. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, the science gets done, but, mm. but they're underappreciated by the general public because the pictures aren't so pretty. Yeah. Well, now the pictures are pretty. <laughs> and so radio astronomy can take its rightful place. It's true. Yep. Uh, I'm uploading my audio. Yep, I'm doing the video right now. Uh, so, so Harmon says, can you walk us through the image? Is that Sagittarius A in the middle? Um, yeah. Like, hold on. Right there. There's Sagittarius A. Let me make Are this a little bit smaller so that we can fit more of it on the screen. There. Yeah, Sag A star in the center, and they're still working out all the details and what causes all of the stripes. The the yeah. bubbles are are coming from various um, 
events in the past. Uh, Super old supernovae they yeah. went off. Yeah, you've got these long filaments that are like thousands of light years long. They aren't yeah. entirely sure what they are, but they kind of line up with the magnetic field of the Milky Way. It's which is just wild. Yeah, just really incredible. Again, like all this stuff when they took this image, so much of this was just new. Yeah, and they didn't, and they had no idea what a lot of this stuff was. It's a, it's an astonishing accomplishment, mm -hmm. which. Uh, again, just makes me so much more excited for the square kilometer array. Yes. It's just like <sighs> this plus plus. Um, Grip Taylor's asking, what's the grid on the ground under the spiders? Oh, um, hold on. Let me get back to that. Like some kind of ground or something like connection to so it's a combination of all the cables and stuff run under it and i want to say that it is part of the detector but i'd have to look it up yeah let me look it up be some like image that explains um has anyone been watching star trek discovery not i haven't I caught up on this yet? season yet i need to catch up on this season yeah this season has been really good yeah this has been this season has been terrific i've really been enjoying it especially like last night's episode this week's episode was probably my favorite episode of the whole series really like they really hit their stride it was really clever yeah yeah it was really good you know i don't want to i don't wanna spoil it but they did a great job of of coming of dealing with a mystery of dealing with sort of interactions between people um people tr doing having to do what's right but also trying to minimize their um like trying to be kind mm. while also being willing to use deadly force. And it was, uh, it was so good. It was so good. And it like just every piece of it. And there's just this unfolding mystery and sort of the, and again, I can't, like, I have to talk in sort of vague terms, but, but, but this sort of these analogies to what we're currently doing to the environment and at the same time, sort of, a response anyway i loved it i loved it I, I really enjoyed it so i if you sort of got bored of it like this season has been terrific good that that sounds that sounds amazing i did not i yeah i simply tend to binge things so i yeah. i for instance i just finished watching the expanse um oh good finally what would you think it's really good I want more it's of so this good. universe. And it left me yeah. with a cliff, cliffhanger that's going to force me to read the rest of the books. Yeah, yeah. Carla said there's way more book stuff after what ends in the TV show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so there was, there was a subplot. They didn't wrap up. It wasn't a primary subplot. It was just... Yes. And yeah. I'm sad. And apparently it's quite interesting. There's a bunch of stuff that goes on. Well, you know what? I think we should wrap it then. I I am feeling the allergies are are closing in on me, and uh, I think I'm, I it, I'm just gonna get gross in a second here if I don't wrap this up. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, go and take some uh, take some some medicines and uh, and see about uh, and and write my newsletter. Really that works. Is. Yeah, I love the fact that we've shifted this over to Mondays because now I can write the newsletter on Friday without having astronomy cast sort of drop right down in the middle of, of that day and break it up. But um, but yeah, so now, um, now Wait, I'm, I'm being told that we more. do have questions. Hold on, hold on one second. Okay, okay. Astro Wise, are you, you sure we have questions? I'm oh, my mouse won't scroll. Mouse, why won't, why won't you scroll? Um, so so we've determined that the the that my mouse won't scroll um 
we have determined that the uh, metal thing underneath is part of the the detector. So so the okay. individual bits are the antennae. So yep. that's that's reflectory bits. Um, and then the bottom part is the detector. Okay. Not detect. It's it's like it reflector. I think. Okay. Got it. Um. Oh man, I can't find the questions that Astro Wise referred to. Um. Trust you, Astro Wise. I'm also feeling completely blind. Um. Okay, Abhasi says, I've heard these described as sensitive enough to pick up air traffic control signal <laughs> from Alpha Centauri. How powerful are those compared to TV broadcast radio signals? How powerful are air traffic control compared to TV radio signals? Yeah. Um, well, so so the I... funny thing is, is like in the olden days, our radio signals were actually a lot more powerful than they yeah. are today. So back, say, in the 30s, they would build these gigantic radio towers and blast their radio transmissions as far as they could get them. Because if you just yeah. built one giant radio transmitter and now what thanks to cable and so on, there's less and less a need. So we're actually becoming less radio loud than we were earlier on when radio was the only game in town. Now we have fiber optics. We have, um, Serious radio for your car. Yeah, yeah. So so things have kind of changed. And so that's why a very bright point source of radio emissions is still a air traffic control. And that's why it's such a, I guess it's such a, um, a thing to compare. Um, so Astrowise also asks, any planets visible in that image? No, there aren't any planets in that image that, that are resolved. Um, you can actually see Jupiter very well with a radio telescope, and it's very weird because there is a Taurus, a uh, magnetosphere Taurus around Jupiter that glows. So in radio, um, Jupiter looks more Saturn-like. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's incredible. Like, there are radio images of, of all the planets, and they, they yeah. are giving off certain missions to tell you things about their about their environments their magnetospheres their auroras things like that and they do generate even the sun the sun kind of looks amazing in radio so subgar is saying air traffic control is 120 to 140 megahertz at low power tiny beside radio station i i think hmm. yeah there's a certain there's a certain amount of confusion because different things are going out on different wavelengths where they have different things they have to compete with right. and different goals. Um, yeah. I don't know enough to say anything yeah. on this. Yeah. Um, Veronica is um, saying that broken symmetry <laughs> Sorry. Ask about uh, the Milky Way image. What is the orange spot? I'm pretty sure that's Sag A star. Let me bring yeah, it the, up. Yeah, the right there. I can just move. Okay, we're it. gonna let you just move because that is much <laughs> faster than. Yeah. I don't so know why the the, We think that's the center of the Milky Way. Yeah. And the incredible uh, rate, all of the magnetic fields that are twisted up around the supermassive black hole at the heart of the Milky Way. Yeah. Okay, now I think we have answered all of the questions. Okay, all right. Well, I'm going to wrap things up. Okay. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today on this this impromptu astronomy cast. Thanks uh, to all the, to all the mods. Oh, Citizen Gold just made it, and now oh, we're wrapping no. it. Yeah, um, but thank you, uh, thank you, everyone, for watching us today, both on YouTube and on Twitch. Thanks, Pamela, for bringing the brain, and a future thanks to all of the editors who have to deal with this nonsense as yes. they as they prepare the show for and thank you for the bits trekker kev thank you for the bits all right we'll see you i guess on monday so just in a couple yep. of days we'll be back okay all right <laughs> have Bye a good weekend everyone